Uh, it's two o'clock, so let's get started. <clears throat> I am here to talk about documentation and how it should be not an afterthought, sort of like, ooh, now the project is finished. <gasps> we haven't documented it. This goes both for Plone, but also for your own projects. But first I'll focus on the Plone documentation. Um, as many of you will be aware, the documentation for Plone has changed. And that also means changes for you all, the people who contribute to it, the Plum community. Um, we do have a new docs.plum.org that has lots of documentation. I will go into that a little later. So, I hope you will learn uh, from this talk how you can contribute and how you can also uh, use some of the lessons that we've learned in your own projects. But first, we spin back the clock a couple of months ago. Um, yeah, until April. Uh, the actual only usable documentation that we had was on developerplone.org, and that was started a long time ago by our old friend, a very angry Finn named uh, Mikko Otama, who introduced the world to Angry Bird as a lifestyle choice, and who also um, in innovated in the documentation department by introducing, throwing people into the pool unless they document um, and the, the pool was very cold in Italy, I can tell you, last year. So, yeah, he was very annoyed. Well, he was generally always very annoyed, but he was very annoyed about the state of the Plone documentation a couple of years ago. So he created developerplone.org, basically to scratch his own itch. Um, that was then that grew into, well, an organic collection of widely different docs, and despite the name, it started out as the documentation for developers, but since there was no real other place to stick stuff, um, it also had a documentation for integrators, for themers, for sysadmins, um, which made it all rather difficult to navigate. You would never know exactly where it was. We also had documentation on Plone.org. Um, it was mm, haphazard at best. Uh, there was no real structure to it. And most of it was kind of out of date. There were ha helpful tips in there how to upgrade your Plone 0 0.99 site to 1.1. <laughs> and the kind of stuff you really want people to read when they look for documentation because it gives a really good impression that your project is alive. And there was also, there was even more. Um, there is actually a Plone end user manual, uh, but it was really well hidden. Um, it was even, it's even translated. There are translations into German, into Spanish, into a couple of other languages, only nobody could find them. That was also a bit of a problem. And then there, there is the add-ons. Uh, no Plone site is really com uh, complete without add-ons, but the quality of add-on documentation um, varies. Some have really nice ones. Plone Form Gen is always my prime, prime example. It has nice documentation geared toward the people that use it. Others um, basically stuck in doc tests and called that documentation. If you have ever been guilty of that, I hate you. Um, <laughs> let me tell you, doc tests are neither docs nor tests. Um, just skip them. Um, but especially don't use them as your only documentation. And uh, also, please, if you have an add-on, it really helps if you have like a readme that tells which problem it's actually supposed to solve. So, uh, it was time to change, and, um, well, the Plone community was called to order by Sven, who's sitting there. Thank you very much, Sven. You were, yes. Um, he's now the de facto leader of the documentation team, since uh, Mikko went on to discover bitcoins and do awful things to them. Um, 
So we started to prepare and said like this cannot be continued anymore. We need proper documentation for Plone. Um, and we drank a lot of nice beverages. This was Brazil. The weather was lovely. Yep, is this working? Yes, this was our stand-up meeting in the after uh, conference uh, sprint in Joe Pessoa. Um, if you missed the Brazil sprint, well, here's what you missed. Um, make sure we cannot promise the same kind of weather for Bristol, but um, it is always good to come to the uh, Plum Conference. Yeah, and then we, we were like, okay, something needs to be done, but yeah, then it also needs to be done. So we started planning, and there was the Stroopwafel sprint in Amsterdam. Uh, Stroopwafel is a typically Dutch cookie that is highly addictive, and so we named the sprint after it. Um, and we had cake-driven documentation. The idea was to have several sprints for documentation because it was such a mess. Um, we decided we first wanted a sprint where no actual documentation would be written. It was just meant to strategize and see like what is there, how do we want to organize it. Um, we had expected a couple of people, like three or four, that was the idea. And that escalated quite quickly uh, because a lot of really nice people came. Um, we had uh, Asko Suka, who is our resident master of robots. Um, we had a documentation expert, uh, Sissy Nutt. Some of you may remember her. She was part of the Plum community, has since moved on. She is a documentation expert for Elsevier, which is a giant publisher, uh, so she knows documentation. That really helped. Um, we had Armin, uh, who knows a lot about marketing and talking to audiences, and nine other people from all over Europe. Um, that was really nice. It was way more than we expected, and that way we could also get way more done than we had expected. So it was a really good beginning. Um, we had identified all the gaps in the documentation, and there were quite a few. We haven't solved them all, but at least we know where they are now. Um, we also realized that Plone 5 is uh, in the making, and that will change a lot, both for developers, but also for themers and for end users. And not everybody will uh, upgrade to Plone 5 the minute it comes out. Um, upgrading takes time, takes planning, takes budget. So people will be on Plone 4 for the foreseeable future. So we needed a way to have documentation up for both versions. And while we're at it, we were like, okay, then we can also keep the documentation for Plone 3 up. Um, because still, people are on it, and you want that to be available, but you don't want it to clutter up the documentation for Plone 4. So we devised a way to version the documentation, and we had the plan to consolidate all documentation. Um, so no more separate websites for end users, for themers, for developers because a lot of people are a little bit of everything. Um, some people are like a themer, but occasionally they do have to delve, delve into the uh, sysadmin stuff to set up the Plone site. Uh, end users can become power users and can set up their own stuff. So those divisions and audiences are fluid, so it's best to have it all in one place. And our main work that uh, weekend was to come up with a mind map, and that mind map is available on Docs uh, on the GitHub, it is quite big, we still need to update it, but um, that had all the little bits of information that we found on Plown from, I think it was 16 different websites that we gathered uh, documentation from. Um, we all put them in the mind map and said like, okay, these are the audiences that we want to, this is how we want to structure the documentation. And, uh, well, the cake was very good, so we got a lot more done. Um, we decided it would also be excellent if we could have proper multilingual documentation and um, not cook our own little soup as we had done before, but use uh, the things that other people use. Uh, translation is a problem that we're not alone with, and other people have uh, developed really cool tools, which I'll show you in a little bit. 
Um, it was also, we noted that there was absolutely no license on the whole documentation. Um, some parts had GPL stuck onto it, um, some parts had just nothing. And that is really annoying because you want people to use your documentation. So you want to have a really liberal license, but you do want to have a license. Um, so we discussed a lot about that. Uh, we talked to a couple of lawyer people from the EFF Europe, um, and we picked a license, namely the Creative Commons one, which is much more appropriate for documentation than a software license as a GPL. And although we had said that we would never actually touch the documentation um, that weekend, uh, we delved into the knowledge base on clone.org and the information there was outright harmful. So we were like, okay, this has to go right now. So this is a little picture. Um, I think we killed an entire forest in post-it notes that weekend. I'm very sorry, but they died for a good cause. Uh, right after that was the cathedral sprint, uh, a mass sprint. Um, this seems to be the year of the clone mass sprints. If your sprint has under 30 people, you have so lost. It's like they're getting bigger. The cathedral sprint had lots of people from all over the world, including from the US and mostly from Europe because it was in Germany. And lots of stuff was done there, but also documentation. Um, and we were getting less nice. Uh, we were actually putting stuff in other people's uh, repos and said like, this is a bug, you don't have documentation. <laughs> uh, developers don't like that, but after a while they do see the logic behind it. Then uh, we had uh, about a month break or one and a half months and on it went to Munich where we had the work sprint for the documentation and there were not as many people unfortunately, we were six people I think in total, but we had plenty of time. Uh, Max and Alexander um, were kind enough to host us, um, even putting their, uh, us up in their apartments so it was a really cheap sprint. <laughs> And there we started to work. Um, we tested the docs on actual humans. That was really nice. We had some uh, people there from the local Python user group who hadn't uh, worked with Plone before. So they were ideal candidates. So we made them read the documentation and make them circle like, what the fuck is this about? Um, so we could really improve it by having like guinea pigs. Um, we also had the luxury, uh, Alexander works for a university there, and they have professional documentation writers. That's their only job, they write documentation. So we could um, run our mind map past them and have a sanity check, like, are we completely mad? But um, that woman was actually like, no, this is more or less how I would structure it. So we were like, phew, <laughs> job well done. Thanks again, Sissy, because she did most of that ordering, uh, or she guided us a lot in it. So then we started to actually physically create the structure and copy all the docs in the right place. So we had to fix an immense amount of broken links. Um, apparently nobody had ever bothered to check any kind of, run any kind of link checker on our documentation, which is a bit painful. So we did that. We started pulling in external documentation from add-ons. Um, we're using, for the technical people, git sparse, which is really cool. Um, git sparse means you can just pull in uh, a, uh, a specific directory from uh, uh, a repository, because we don't want all the source code and all the other stuff that would just clutter it up. So we can say, just give us the slash doc directory, that's all we want and then we could do stuff with it and present it in a nice way. Uh, Alexander started working on themes because, yeah, uh, we were using Sphinx, Sphinx can use themes, and we wanted to have uh, different themes for the different varieties of Plone. So we now have, our current theme is for Plone 4, uh, we're working on uh, the uh, theme for Plone 5, which will not as a surprise, look amazingly like the Barcelona theme. We will just steal the CSS, basically. And the Plone 3 documentation looks exactly like Plone 3, and it's like 
ooh, were we really that ugly? Yes, we were. But it was a sign of the times. So it, uh, it looks exactly like a Plone 3 site. Um, and we also worked on the PDF creation because in the end, the a nice thing about um, uh, Sphinx is that it can not only output uh, HTML, but you can also output it into PDF or as an EPUB, so you can carry Plone wherever you want. Hello. Yeah. Um, we were quite productive that weekend, and we also took the bold step of actually uh, discussing uh, about guidelines. Um, we, we didn't want to call it an order, but um, yeah, they're guidelines, but we will ask everybody to stick to those. And we cleaned up the tickets. And this is Alexander with the mind map. They had a really nice plotter there. <laughs> and there was another sprint, also in Munich, uh, the beer and wine sprint. You do notice a theme running through the names of our sprints. <laughs> so we did lots more stuff and we actually wrote the guidelines. And we also noticed that some parts were missing and that was probably also, this is a good illustration of um, how we not always take documentation serious. We have marketed, well, we don't market that well at all, but for Plone 4.2, the big announcement was like, we have new collections. We plastered it all over the site and we were like, yes, we have new collections. There was no documentation on how to make those. That's just painful. And I wrote that now, there is now documentation and it actually takes five minutes to do it. You need three screenshots, you need 10 fingers and you're done. So we really need to step up our game and if we have new features, we need to document them because otherwise people won't use them. So the first important change, there we made it official. We also decided to uh, move the, the documentation from the collective uh, into the Plone uh, repository. Um, that means that it's more or less officially owned by the foundation. Uh, whereas the collective is much more loose. Why? Because we wanted to stick a license on it, and then you first have to own it before you can do that. So we said, yeah, we'll just own it. The license is Creative Commons, it's just attribution, so people can use it, they can make tons of money out of it, um, whatever, if you want to print a book and become filthy rich by it hitting the bestseller list, be my guest. Um, this is the most liberal license that we could find. The only thing is, in order to have it in the Plone uh, <coughs> directory, was that people would have to sign a contributor agreement, uh, which is annoying. Well, we did find out that everybody who had contributed to the documentation up to that point had already signed one. So that wasn't an issue, but most of you will have already signed the contributor agreement. I guess nobody actually read it because the language is horrible. Um, we need to change that. But there is now also a recent discussion that we may not even need a contributor agreement anymore. You would just need a sort of declaration of intent, which could be much, much simpler. But the discussion is not quite over yet. Uh, I would like a few lawyers to look at that, or at least legal types. Um, so now we have docs.plone.org which is one landing page. Um, it's divided the, the logic in there. We really focused on audiences. So we start by the end users, uh, themers, site admins, um, like yeah, yeah, the super user, the deployers, which is our current term for sysadmins, because they don't need to be sysadmin, but they are deploying, so they need stuff about Apache or Nginx, and that's uh, developers, like add-on developers, and also core developers. The fancy stuff is that we now have different versioning. Uh, we have, uh, yeah, we have currently have Plone 3 and uh, Plone 4. Um, and yeah, we will start on Plone 5 when, as soon as it sort of stabilizes. Um, we have different languages. As a test, uh, we have now Italian, um, Dutch, and a couple of others. And the integration is with TransFX. TransFX is a web service. Um, they, they are sort of like the GitHub for translators. 
they have totally, they own that market. Uh, everybody who is a translator knows TransFX. So we were like, let's get in there. Uh, the nice thing about it is a two-way integration. We can directly shoot our, uh, all our documentation into TransFX. It becomes a translatable string there. And the results can automatically be pulled into our repository again. So I can show you how that looks. Um, here is one page, the about page. Uh, here is the English. And um, on the right, I can translate into my curious grunting language, Dutch. Uh, but TransFX has lots of helpers. You can use uh, machine translation from either Google or Microsoft as an initial starting point. Their translation is usually crap, but it might give you suggestions. But what is really practical is that it also uh, includes suggestions from your entire project. So if I now am on description, uh, oh, the resolution is a bit... It already has a suggestion for me because somebody else has already translated it. So, description, somebody else translated it as omschrijving, which is actually correct. So I say, yep, that's the one I want. I will save it. So now that makes translating really quick and more consistent, because often there are many words you can translate, or you can translate using different words, but for the end user it's a lot easier if they're all the same word, if you use page and not um, any other synonym of those. And uh, thanks to the inimitable Asko Suka, we also have screenshot integration. Um, he can use, uh, well, we all can, but he wrote it, uh, robot tests that will actually create your screenshots for you. And that is really fun because as you update your clone, um, the screenshots also update. If you change the language, the screenshots will be in the appropriate language. And uh, our end goal is to make it so that you can also do that with a theme of your choice. So the end user documentation can then be filled with screenshots from your university, your office, your organization. We've been collecting a lot more documentation, uh, add-ons, some of the add-ons that are more or less essential nowadays, Plone Up Testing, uh, Plone Form Gen, Dexterity, which still has uh, had its own uh, uh, repo for the documentation, but yeah, it's, it, we ship with it now, so the documentation needs to be on there. And we have PDF creation. It's not quite working as we want um, because um, yeah, some uh, we want the images to look nicer, but it's already quite workable. This is, uh, we are now at 2,069 pages. It comes with pictures and stuff, and it's actually quite nice. So we do have lots of documentation. Uh, the logic behind it, uh, the old developer plone org was sort of like a Franken repo. It had lots of deep dark magic in there, which nobody exactly understood how it worked. Well, perhaps Miko, but sometimes I doubt that even he understood it. Um, we decided to split it up. We have one with content, just pure restructured text files, and one with magic. So that's a nice clear separation. The documentation one has plain uh, text files, in this case restructured text, which is like a markup language, uh, a branch for every version of Plown, and directories for the languages. And Papyrus is the, the uh, project where the magic happens. It pushes and pulls from TransFX. It pulls in all the external documentation, and it has the full robot framework to generate those screenshots. We also implemented uh, a policy that was stolen from Rock Garbas. He calls it, what is it? The Mongolian double step or something. There is a code name for it that sounds really cool. <laughs> uh, but basically we said nobody is allowed to commit onto the documentation directly. Um, also, the documentation itself does not 
do that. We do everything via pull request. And you never get to merge your own pull request. You always need a second pair of eyes, which helps to uh, avoid silly mistakes. And we do, uh, uh, well, at the moment we check manually, but uh, we check if the uh, restructured text is formatted correctly. And the easiest way is by generating a PDF because LaTeX is very anal about syntax. So if it goes through, uh, HTML generation is easy, but LaTeX is very, very, very picky. Um, the guidelines, I have summarized them for you. The first thing is like, no more PEP8. Please people, there was, there was a time when there was a recommendation that PEP8 should be applied to documentation. Please, please, please don't. Use syntactic uh, line breaks, so break at the end of a, sen a sentence. Um, you can even break at the end of a paragraph. Um, why? Well, first of all, there is no reason for PEP8 to be in documentation. It's a style guide for code. This is not code. Um, and most of all, if you if we go back to the transfix, here I have a paragraph that I can then translate. Um, if you do uh, PEP8 and you randomly put hard line re uh, returns in the documentation, I will get half a sentence here. Half a sentence is impossible to translate. Um, and I would uh, recommend to actually, if you have a short paragraph, just do it all on one line. Because quite often, uh, English has the habit of making short sentences. German has the uh, habit of making very long sentences. So what is a paragraph in uh, English could very well be one sentence in German. And that just makes the trans job for the translators easy. So try to divide it up by in sort of logical uh, bite sizes and uh, break after those. But do not do it after 78 characters just because somebody told you to. Um, there is no reason for that. This is prose, this is uh, verse, this is not code. But do document. Um, Please don't say, like, look at, everybody can look at the code, I don't need to document. Um, no. And we have tested on real developers and they have stuck to it. Uh, Timo has, uh, was the first one to adopt it and rewrite all his documentation according to the new style guides. And he's a real hardcore dev. So it is possible for developers to do this. But we also want to make it easy to use, so there are some helper tools. Um, if you, you just saw the lightning talk on Mr. Gutenberg, that will write a, a sort of uh, boilerplate code for you so that you don't have to think about that and it all, it all will be in the right place. Um, also searching the documentation, um, there is a plugin for uh, Sublime, the text editor, there is also a Firefox uh, search add-on, so you can search specifically in the documentation directly from your Firefox. And Sven, I think it works for Chrome now as well. Yes, Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll repeat it for the video. Um, it now auto-installs. If you go to docsplone.org, it will say, like, you can install this in Firefox. And also it works on, uh, on Chrome. And um, Giacomo Spatoli has, um, I think it's ready? Yeah, it's, it is ready. He has uh, made a, uh, it available on Dash, which is an uh, Apple-only app. But there is an open source alternative called Zeal or Zell, I don't know how to pronounce it. But um, you can search documentation directly from there. And if you folks say like, well, there is this other tool that all of us are using, please let us know and we will try to get it in there. Well, and onto the future, we have lots of plans. Um, of course, well, as I said, the themes should be fitting for the version of Plum. Um, we also desperately need icon fonts in there to make it pretty, so all the exclamation marks and other stuff just look pretty. Um, we want the site-specific screenshots um, so that you can indeed have uh, your manual in 
the, the theme of your choice. We, need, we so need to robotize everything. And we will try to work with the framework team to get a clip in to stuff uh, pointers to the documentation directly into Plown. Um, have little pointers at the front page, but also at difficult parts like um, the configuration screen uh, where people will be like, <gasps> panic attack, panic attack, where, which button do I press? There should be a little link to the documentation. And as the documentation now has a stable URL, uh, URL that should be possible. Uh, we also plan to hook the documentation into Jenkins. So we still need to figure out some useful metric to use, like when do you break the documentation? Because, um, yeah, uh, Sphinx generates tons of warnings. Uh, some of them are unavoidable. Um, some are, it says, like, your link is broken. And then it, you look at it, and then the link is to localhost 8080, which, yes, probably will be broken at the time Sphinx runs. So we need to exclude those. That's still a bit of work. Um, and one of the more ambitious, pl uh, ambitious plans that has been hatched out together with the framework team is that um, for the PLIPs, the plan improvement uh, proposals, um, people that write a PLIP will be ass assigned a body from the documentation team to make sure that we never again add new features and forget to document them, because that's just plain stupid. So it doesn't mean that if you write the code, you have to document it yourself. We can help with that. We can find other people, but it needs to be formalized so that we don't end up with great new features with no documentation. Well, and not all is rosy in the world of documentation, unfortunately. And there are still some things missing, and maybe some of you can even help with that. Um, there is a lot of documentation still missing. We have identified gaps. It's in the mind map. Uh, slowly, we're starting to write stuff about it. But yeah, there are still some gaps, unfortunately. But also in the tool set. Uh, restructured text is not the easiest to write, unfortunately. It is just a markdown thing. Uh, it looks like uh, our markdown is another variety of uh, one of those markup languages. Um, they have better editors, better looking ones. Um, and the ones for, I can show you a few, um, like this is the one for Markdown. Looks really pretty. Here on the left, you write stuff. And here on the left, you get an instant preview. And it integrates with GitHub, it integrates with Google Doc, it's really nice. Um, on the other hand, um, this is how the, cur the current best restructured one looks. And it's sort of like a high 1997 called and wants it website back. It's functional, but it's ugly as hell. So um, we would like something nicer. Um, and the nice ones like these, um, all re uh, re they're all written in JavaScript and HTML5, and they all rely on the same uh, single JavaScript library to translate from what you write into Markdown. So basically, if we could find or write a JavaScript library that does it into restructured text, we're all set. Because all the fancy bits like showing it on screen, integrating with GitHub, whatever, is all done. But it just needs an output filter to restructure text. But my JavaScript really sucks. So I can't write that. Um, but yeah, hopefully. We can integrate it some way. Uh, I have tried doing it with PamDoc, which is a tool which can convert from different flavors of uh, markup languages, but the results are not as pretty. So that's one thing that's severely missing. Uh, um, so if anybody says, like, I know JavaScript really well, or I know a friend of mine who does that really well and is like up for the challenge of writing a library, that would be awesome. Many people will thank you. Um, another part is the robot screenshots. Writing robot tests for them is actually not hard. It's quite simple, it's human understandable, but it's just a lot of work. It's very labor intensive. But once you have them, you have them. So it's really great, but we'll need helper tools for that. Um, luckily, we are not the only one that find robot tests annoying to write. Um, one of the great 
uh, benefits of talking to a lot of people was uh, I was approached by a person who uh, had worked with the Plum community in Germany on the uh, uh, open gar uh, what is it the CMS Garden initiative. Uh, CMS Garden is uh, an initiative in Germany where all the open source content management systems work together have like a pavilion on Sebit, which is an insanely large uh, tra uh, trade show uh, on computers, and they do it throughout Germany. And in the beginning, everybody was like, hmm, this is going to be weird. We're going to be with Plone and Drupal and all those people in the same room, and we're not supposed to kill each other and make nasty jokes. But it actually turned out really well. It turns out that most Drupal people are actually nice people as well. You can drink a beer with them. And that, well, they program in PHP, but for the rest, they're almost normal humans, and they're at least open source people. So the whole idea was like, um, it's better to increase the overall open source market share against the proprietary ones that have like tons of money on marketing and bribing and whatever, whining and dining. And so this Drupal uh, guy who does most of the Drupal documentation um, was like, okay, who can I talk to? And he ended up with me. Uh, he's organizing a Bright the Docs conference in Berlin where Sven and me and some other people will also be going. But most of all, he has written, still writing a tool called walkhop.net. And what that does, it, it allows, it's really easy to create walkthroughs. So you just click through a site um, and at each stage of the click you can write, you can type in uh, an, a sort of admonishment like click here or fill in your name here or you can do guidelines uh, like that. But the really ni nice thing about it is that, well, it's extremely user-friendly but it saves it as Selenium tests. Aha! Uh -huh. And the Selenium tests uh, are I will uh, meet up with him and we, uh, we will write, we've already almost completed it, uh, an output to write directly our flavor of robot syntax. So basically anybody can now create robot uh, uh, tests um, by just clicking through a website. That opens up a lot more possibility for generating more documentation. You don't need to be a technical person you need to be somebody who's willing to invest some time to make a demonstration. But it's nicer, you don't have to do a screencast, um, you don't have to talk, so people won't listen to your voice, which mo most people find scary. Um, you just click through and type in your explanations. Which is also good because uh, screencasts have, uh, usually if they're a video, they are inaccessible to uh, people with different abilities, whereas these are much easier to follow. So we uh, will work with this, uh, with the Drupal community in creating like a generic uh, tool to uh, generate robot tests. Well, how can you contribute? Well, of course you can write documentation, but if you're like, oh no, I'm, I'm, I'm never writing documentation, I'm a real coder. Excellent, we can use you too. Uh, you can help write the tools. You can help create the walkthroughs and also videos and screencasts are still a very useful marketing tool. Uh, we cannot re rely completely on uh, of them because of accessibility, but um, well, I think most of you have heard that there are still people using uh, Sean Kelly's amazing videos from back in the days and that convinced them to use Plone. So if you have a bit of flair, um, do make videos, it's really great. Um, in your own projects, um, please use the guidelines as they're written on uh, docsplone.org. Uh, that makes it easy to, for your add-on to be included in that documentation, which will mean that a lot more people will actually read it and use it. Um, but even if you don't, um, it's a good, it's generic good practice to follow those guidelines. Um, if you can, from the beginning, create uh, robot screenshots, you will save yourself lots of hassle in the later days. Uh, Osco has written various blog posts about it. It's really not that hard. Um, I, can, I will put a link in the slides later as well. Uh, one thing that is 
some people are really fond of it, especially the really nerdy uh, people, but what makes documentation really hard is to rely on auto-generated auto docs, like um, API listings and whatever. They are boring as hell. Uh, they don't really explain stuff. The people that read through um, 11 pages of auto-generated docs are actually the same people that will actually look at the code and understand it from there. Uh, the people that will not read through that are the people you need to reach with your documentation. So they have very limited use. You may feel good, sort of like, ooh, all my functions are documented. Yeah, but um, they're not humanly usable. Um, developers will just as easily read all the, the strings in your code itself. Um, and end users or integrators that will try to decide if your product is a fit for their problem will be turned off quite rapidly and will be fast asleep by the time they try to find the download button. So plan ahead, write your documentation and always focus on your audience. Start with the most generic audience, start with the end users and generically build up to sort of like the hardcore if you want to contribute to, to this uh, project, here's what you do. Think in the beginning already, also for your add-on products about versioning, uh, about a way to version also your documentation because your product will evolve and will have other features, so you need to version the documentation as well. Um, and think of uh, putting it under a license that's actually usable by other people. It can help to put your documentation directly under a Creative Commons license and the rest of your code under GPL. And honestly, I don't really care. If you want to have it on docsplone.org, we are more than happy to integrate it. Read the docs is also still fine. And if it's just for you, uh, for your organization, you can, have, of course, always have it on a private one. But Sphinx is really nice to build documentation in all cases. And why should we do this? Well, we want to show the world a better system. We need to document what we're doing and also I read the other people's documentation when I'm evaluating stuff. If the documentation is really bad, there is a big chance that I'll say, uh, not interested, I'll look for alternatives. Uh, we're in a market that has alternatives. Um, we need to convey a really good impression and the first impression is often the documentation. If I look for a customer management uh, system, the first thing I do is click on documentation. Let's see if I can understand their docs. Um, so that's how other people will judge the Plone project. That's why we have to do it. It's, if you do it right from the start, the amount of work is actually not that much. It's more that you have to get it into your system and you feel really good when it's done. And that's always nice. That was it. Questions? Oh God, <laughs> I hope it wasn't me, I hope it was the lunch <laughs> that made you all fall asleep. So are, are, the, uh, are the two versions, uh, or are the various versions of documentation available now? I, I can't find them. On no, they are not online yet uh, because basically we've just started the, the fork for Plone 3, um, but we still need to sort out a lot because basically we just created a copy of Plone 4 because that was all that was available. And we decided to prioritize the Plone 4 version because that's what most people use now. And yeah, first fill up gaps in the documentation and the Plone 3 stuff still has to be done. And we have, we have documentation that needs to go in there because it's outdated, but people still need it, like XDV and other stuff. Uh, so we want to do it in there, but yeah, it, it was a capacity problem. It's on our to-do list, but we need more people to work on it, basically. And Plum 5 was changing. Um, I mean, the, the most important stuff that we need to get ready for Plum 5 is the end user stuff, but um, that has changed quite dramatically over the last two months. So we were like, yeah, if we start to do it now, um, it's gonna be a lot of work to keep it updated. 
we might as well wait till, well now the alpha is out, but by the time the uh, first beta is out, the documentation should also be online. Okay, well. Ah. <laughs> So if you want a European holiday at the beginning of next year and don't want to be all by yourself and want to <laughs> do some coding and some documenting, we have the perfect package for you. <laughs> Okay, thank you.